Hello, I'm Andrew Manitas, Chairman of the Committee for Citizen Awareness, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization which produces this videotape. Some of America's finest companies and organizations are concerned about the fact that our country, the world's greatest democracy, participates in its government at such a low rate. I'd like to introduce you now to the person and the organization in your area addressing this problem and making this important videotape available to you. Hello, my name is Ed Pumphrey. I am general manager of the Cedar Springs Mill of Georgia Pacific. The United States of America usually has the lowest voter participation in the world. In recent times, including the election of Bill Clinton, slightly more than half of those 18 or older actually voted. Your vote can literally change history. President Clinton would have lost the popular vote to George Bush if Clinton voters switched to Bush in numbers equal to only one out of 50 eligible voters. A number fewer than one out of every 300 high school students could have changed the electoral college victory of President Carter. Georgia Pacific believes the keystone of our republic is the participation of the people, participation on election day, and participation in the making of public policies that affect us all. In order to do that, one must know how the Congress works and how to participate in that process. In this videotape, you will learn how the Congress can work for you. You will also learn who your representatives are in Washington, D.C. By featuring them in the videotape, we are neither endorsing nor opposing them. We are simply helping you to learn more about the job they are elected to do for you. In this videotape, you will also hear from the award-winning newsman Howard K. Smith. Now you are going to hear about how you should relate to the Congress by the person who should know better than anyone else, your Congressman Bishop. Hello. My name is Congressman Sanford Bishop. I was first elected to Congress in 1992 to represent our area or congressional district. The boundaries of our district run from Macon west to Columbus, down the Chattahoochee River to the Georgia-Florida border, and over to Valdosta, up from Valdosta, up the interstate to Macon once again. It's really middle and south Georgia. It's the southwest quadrant of the state and it's called the Second District of Georgia. Congress. Everyone knows something about it. It's in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. But do you know specifically how Congress works? Do you know the details of how I, as your member of Congress, go about representing you? This videotape will address these questions. Hello, I'm Howard K. Smith, and I want to tell you about the job of a member of Congress, how a member meets his day-to-day -day responsibilities, and the role you can play in those activities. But before we get into that, here are some interesting facts about the Congress. There are two equal parts of the Congress, the House and the Senate. Each state, regardless of its population, sends two senators to Washington. A senator stands before the voters for re-election every six years. The senators elected to represent the state of Georgia are Sam Nunn and Paul Coverdell. In this tape, we will talk primarily about the House of Representatives. In the House, things are somewhat different from the Senate. House members are elected more frequently, and there are more of them. The number of representatives a state has in Washington depends on its population. California, for example, sends 52 representatives to Washington, while Vermont sends only one. Your state, Georgia, sends 11 members of Congress to Washington. The Founding Fathers believed that the members of Congress should stand before voters for re-election very frequently, every other year. For such frequent elections, the member According tends to, to spend President, more time in his or her district learning the wishes of the voters. The, the Founding Fathers wanted to be sure that the House of Representatives Please reflects more closely the right will hand. of the country. As a result, every two years, those of you who are 18 or older have an opportunity to communicate to your representative what kind of job you think your member has been doing or not doing. You might be interested to know that the size and structure of the House and Senate are much different today than when the Constitution was written. Initially, there were only 65 representatives in the House. As the country grew, so did the number of representatives. About 50 years ago, or the time of the Great Depression, 
the number of members had grown to 435, and a permanent limit was set at that number. Another interesting bit of history is, initially one member of Congress represented 30,000 people. That's about one half the capacity of a professional football stadium. Today, each member serves approximately 550,000 people, enough to fill nine stadiums. On a typical day, a member of Congress plays two different roles, that of lawmaker and that of representative of constituents. Let me tell you first about lawmaking. The representative's job for the nation primarily concerns making new laws or changing old ones. Members of Congress rarely deal with the kind of laws people usually think of in the expression, breaking the law. Rather, the laws they deal with are usually known as government policies and programs. Another way to think of this part of the Congress's job is they decide where your tax dollars are spent. For example, in 1992, Congress spent tax dollars for such things as highways, national defense, agricultural programs, and the like. It is each member's primary job to try to ensure that whatever actions the Congress takes are for the good of the people in the representative's district, namely you. The, the members also should consider their effect on the rest of America. Some of the issues that we will be dealing with in Congress this year will be crime and health care. How do we fight crime and make our communities safe and secure and free from crime and drugs and violence? How do we assure that each and every American will have affordable, accessible health care? These are two issues that will dominate our efforts in Congress this year and which will affect all of the American people throughout this country. A member's day generally begins very early. Members often have breakfast meetings with people from the district who want to discuss matters like taxes, government regulations, or a new local health program. It is through meetings like these that members learn firsthand from the people affected by the laws how those laws are actually working or not working. The mornings are also used to study laws that have been proposed and introduced, which are commonly referred to as bills. To the Members of Congress devised a simple and effective yes, method for dealing so with hundreds of complex bills that they must that consider. Since it would be impossible for anybody to try to delve into all the bills, the House of Representatives has divided itself into committees, each concerned with a particular subject area, like foreign policy or banking policy, for example. Each committee is then further divided into subcommittees, which handle more specific issues. Any now, one committee contains about 10% of the entire House of Representatives. Would look at the, the typical subcommittee contains about 4% of the entire House. Most members of Congress serve on one to three committees. For example, I serve on the Agriculture Committee, the Post Office and Civil Service Committee, and the Veterans Affairs Committee. On the Agriculture Committee, I serve on several subcommittees. One of them is Specialty Crops and Natural Resources, which deals with peanuts, tobacco, and forestry. I serve on the General Commodities Subcommittee, which deals with cotton, soybeans, wheat, among others, and the Department Operations and Nutrition Subcommittee, which deals with USDA operations and nutrition programs. On the Post Office and Civil Service Committee, I serve on the subcommittee on postal operations, which deals with the operations of our postal service. On the veterans committee, I serve on the hospitals and health care subcommittee, dealing with health care for our nation's veterans. And I serve as vice chairman of the housing and memorial affairs committee, which deals with VA loans and death related benefits. We're interested in serving on committees which help us as members of Congress to improve the quality of life for all of the citizens that we represent in our districts here in Georgia and across the country. We hope that through improvement of the quality of life that all of our people, and the people of this country, will indeed get the services that they need from their national government in the Congress.
Most major bills that the, the committees consider originate in the executive branch departments headed by President Clinton's cabinet members. The executive branch works closely with members of Congress, frequently providing information and expertise. Members of Congress often combine the information that they learn from people like you living in the congressional district with information from national interest groups. Members of Congress then use this information to develop and introduce their own bills to solve the nation's problems. Now you should have a pretty good idea about the job and the structure of Congress. As you will soon see, the system is so set up that appropriate people can have assurance that their views will be taken into consideration. Members of Congress begin learning a lot about a bill which was introduced by a fellow representative at a hearing in the committee uh, or subcommittee. The representatives invite experts on a subject and people such as yourselves who are affected by that subject to tell them about it. Usually these people's opinions can be heard in full in a matter of only a few hours. There are some subjects on which it takes days or even weeks to hear all the testimony. But there's not time to hear everyone who wants to testify. Some will be asked to submit their views in writing. These views will then be printed in the hearing record and considered by the members of Congress. Most people find these hearings quite interesting, but some don't. After holding hearings, members of Congress and their advisors then take a few days or weeks to study on their own the information presented. Committee members also learn a lot about bills they're considering through their constituents. Many experts believe that constituent opinion has the greatest impact on a member's vote. By the end of the hearing process, members of the committee have learned a great deal about the subject of the proposed bill. They then must make some tough decisions. They gather again as a committee. First, they may vote on any changes they might want to make in the bill as a result of what they've learned. They then vote to approve or defeat the resulting bill. A bill approved by committee next goes to all members of Congress for their consideration. Accompanying the bill is a little known, but very crucial document called the committee report. This relatively short report explains the pluses and minuses of the bill in a way that is understandable to people who are not familiar with the technical details of the subject. These reports are also available to the public. When the bill comes before all 435 members of Congress for consideration, the members meet on the House floor, the place in the Capitol building where all members can gather. Those members who were not on the committee which considered the bill, that's about 90% of the group, must begin learning about it in detail. The House they turn for guidance to the committee report and the testimony record. To members of Congress with whom they generally agree and who served on the committee considering the bill, to the executive branch, to national organizations interested in the bill, Several. and to you. Our country's okay. best experts believe that your opinion has more impact on how your representative votes than any other single source they consult. So you can see why it is very important to the process that you bring your opinion to the attention of your member of Congress. Armed with all of this information, members of Congress are able to make reasoned judgments as to how a bill would affect their constituents and the country. Some members can make up their minds very quickly, for others it takes much longer. When the bill comes before all members of Congress on the House floor, they may try to persuade their fellow representatives to support their position, to offer amendments to change parts of the bill, and finally vote for or against the bill. On an average day in Washington, members of Congress cast about three votes. It is not necessary for a member to remain on the House floor during the entire discussion, and in fact, many do not. If you've ever been in Washington and have watched the proceedings from the public gallery or balcony which overlooks the floor, you probably saw few members. The members can keep up with what's going on while working at their desks because these proceedings are telecast into their offices. After a bill is approved by the full House of Representatives, it is then sent to the Senate where a similar procedure is followed. It is considered by senators in a subcommittee and a full committee, and finally debated, amended, and voted on by the total membership on the Senate floor. Typically, the Senate and House do not approve exactly the same bill. A small number of House members and senators meet in what is called a House-Senate conference to try to agree on a compromise bill that can be approved by both houses. Once approved, a bill then leaves Congress and goes to the White House. The president may sign the bill into law or try to kill it with a veto. If he vetoes it, the Congress can still get it into law if both bodies can muster a two-thirds majority vote to override it.
Not all of the representative time is spent working on laws. One of the most important functions is serving constituents, people like yourself. The representative frequently meets with constituents to hear their concerns, both in Washington and within the district. Most members would like to meet with every constituent if that were at all possible. But aside from all the work that would stack up in Washington, it would be impossible. If a member of Congress did nothing else but just meet with each constituent for only 10 minutes, it would take all day, every day, for 20 years. Nonetheless, members of Congress are in almost constant contact with their constituents about one issue or another, so that they can keep abreast of constituent problems and opinions. Many people around the country often find the bureaucracy frustrating. It is the congressional office's duty yes, to sure. ease that frustration and provide a link between the maze of federal departments and agencies and the people for whom they were created to serve. The average House member spends at least one-third of his or her time on constituent matters and receives over 300 letters a day. Some of these letters may have been from you or someone you know. These letters concern diverse issues, help in recovering a lost Social Security check, requests for information, or the like. Constituents also offer their opinions about current matters like the health care system and crime. Members of Congress rely heavily on their staff, many of whom are drawn from communities in the district. Under the member's supervision, the staff follows up on constituent problems by bringing the issues before government agencies and by researching them for solutions. Sometimes the staff also for helps example, the representative Indiana, draft Lafayette. bills or analyze the hundreds of bills and amendments on which the member has to vote. The average representative has approximately 18 staff members. Not really that many when one realizes that it means only one staffer for every 30,000 constituents. Even with the help received from staff, the representative's day doesn't end with the last vote in the House. The members spend still more hours and often weekends returning phone calls from constituents, answering letters from the district, or meeting with fellow members to negotiate about a bill. Let me take a moment to comment on my fellow members of Congress. On the whole, they are hardworking people who devote their time and energy to make sure that the opinions of their constituents are represented in Washington. The position of a U.S. representative can be seen as prestigious, yet I'm impressed by the number of my colleagues who have not forgotten where they came from or why they're in Washington. It's an outstanding group of men and women with whom I am proud to serve. If there's one thing I'd like for you to learn from this tape, it is that your congressional staff, my staff, and I are in Washington and in the district to hear your views and to represent you. So don't hesitate to contact us. All you have to do is address your letter to me at the U.S. House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. I'll get it without any problem, or you can just call information for the telephone number of my office in the district or in Washington. I hope to hear from you. Thank you, Congressman Bishop. A little more than half of our 17 to 18-year-olds can name their representatives in Congress. In fact, too many citizens of all ages can't name their representatives. We hope this videotape will encourage more people, young and old, to participate in the workings of the congressman. Now that you know more detail about the way things work in Washington, we hope you will feel more comfortable fulfilling your role as a citizen. The author of our Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, was right when he said, our liberty can never be safe but in the hands of the people. Become more involved in the issues that concern you. Let your representative in the United States Congress know your views. If you are 18 or older and not registered to vote or do not cast your ballot, please start now. Together we can keep this country the greatest country in the world. Thank you. In the last 20 minutes, you've seen what a typical day is like for a member of Congress. You've been reminded how a bill becomes law, the role of the congressional staff, and most importantly, the crucial role that you as citizens have in the whole legislative process. I hope this behind the scenes look at Congress will cause you to want to know even more about it and to become more actively involved in it. Remember that government of the people, by the people, and for the people will work only if the people take part. Thank you.